Good day, everyone. If we could get everyone just to take a seat, we'll get started in a moment or two. Excellent. I think it's only the bankers still standing, so I feel like I can, I can get started and underway. Um, folks, let me just start with uh, a warm welcome uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, my name is Paul Seip, and I'm BMO's Head of Business Banking uh, for Western Canada. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement in advance of some formal remarks. As we gather here today, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that the land that we live on has, for many millennia, been the traditional territory of Indigenous nations. Here on the shores of the North Saskatchewan River, this land has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations, and we honour and recognise the First Peoples and their ongoing contributions to the vibrancy of our communities today. We're grateful for the opportunity to live and work together on this land. Now, we are excited to have you join us today as Doug Porter, BMO's Chief Economist, will give us a full view on what's happening in the market and how it's impacting our economy and your businesses. With respect to the impact, I'd like to take just a moment and convey our appreciation to each of our guests today for making such an effort to come out and join us. We recognize that there's a lot going on in our collective worlds these days, and that's particularly true right here in Alberta. Our business bankers live and work across the province, and members of our retail, commercial banking, and wealth management teams are also here today, many with their clients. We, we are connecting with hundreds of Alberta's clients uh, each and every day to see how we can help in these challenging times, announcing late last week that relief programs are in place for clients who need help with wildlife, uh, wildfire rather related impacts. And on behalf of the entire BMO team, I'm pleased to share that BMO will be announcing a substantial donation in support of Albertan communities in the short days ahead. Our communities have been on an unprecedented journey over the past three years, and while some small businesses have suffered and even closed during the pandemic, many have innovated and flourished. This is particularly true for our clients here in the Greater Edmonton area. We've helped more clients in this market than ever before, and in comparison to similar cities uh, across Canada, our portfolio, and most importantly, your businesses, have grown faster here than most anywhere else in Western Canada over the last two years. As our clients, you've proven your resilience, you've used your connection to your communities to pivot your business and leverage emerging opportunities. And so collectively, we see that the sectors that you all represent here today represent and reflect 98% of employer businesses in Alberta, and your progress is vital to the region's prosperity. Now, in no way will I suggest uh, that this is easy. We know that many business owners have not necessarily recovered to pre-pandemic performance and are facing, as you'll hear shortly, inflation, labour shortages, some lingering supply chain issues. But in, sure, in short, we recognise that uncertainty rules and that you need a banking team uh, that's here to house, help. Our ask of our teams is pretty straightforward. Work with you, our clients. Proactively look at your personal and business requirements and provide guidance and solutions to help you make real financial progress. We know and respect that the choice of a bank can be one of the most consequential business decisions that you can make, and we're very proud to have the privilege to play a role in your success. It's also why we're particularly proud to bring experts like Doug to help you inform and aid each of your business decisions. As I mentioned, Doug will provide insights on what's happening in our markets and affecting our economy, but I don't think he's prepared to make any predictions around the Oilers season for next year. <laughs> that may be too soon. Uh, and so, uh, for full disclosure, I live in Vancouver. I have to live vicariously through the Oilers, uh, as the Canucks have already gotten their handicap down by three or four strokes uh, this year. Doug's presentation will be followed by a period during which we'll answer all of your questions. We'll have some microphones in the room, and we'll be sure to cover what's on your mind. With that, Doug, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you here today in Edmonton. Uh, first time I've had an opportunity to speak to a crowd like this in Edmonton in I think almost four years, so it's, uh, it's, it's great to be back. Um, so I'm going to spend about the next half hour or so laying out where we see the economy going, what it means for financial markets. I'll talk a bit about the dollar interest rates. I'll get into uh, the housing market as well. Um, but before I get going, and I always like to do this, uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to take a quick poll, just ask you, no right or wrong answer here, just your opinion, whether you are optimistic, cautious, or pessimistic in the year ahead. And how I would define an optimist would be somebody who thinks that the Leafs and the Oilers will finally meet in the Stanley Cup. Oh, sorry, wrong poll. Um, <laughs> An optimist is somebody who thinks all this talk about recession is nonsense and the economy will do just fine over the next year, whereas a cautious person would say, we've just had a 400 basis point rise in interest rates in the past year. That is going to slow things down pretty meaningfully. And finally, a pessimist would be someone who says, we've just had a 400 basis point rise in interest rates and the economy is going to go into a recession for sure over the next year or so. With those unbiased categories, how many people would consider themselves to be an optimist? Show of hands, please. Any optimists in the room? There must be some BMO people here. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, that was, that was about a third of the crowd. Okay, instead, uh, any cautious folks in the room? A slight majority, looks more like about 60% or so. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of pessimists, but any uh, pessimists, anybody think we're going into a full-on recession? One or two, okay, thank you very much. That's actually a little bit more optimistic than than what I've seen in, uh, in, in other venues. Um, by the way, just to cut to the chase, I would uh, definitely put myself in the cautious camp there um, if, if I were to be asked that question, just, just to frame uh, the remarks that are coming at you. First of all, I, I have to say, if last year the mistake that was made by forecasters, by financial markets, by central banks was to underestimate inflation, the mistake I would say that forecasters, financial markets, and central banks have made so far this year is to underestimate the economy. If you look at a lot of professional forecasters, Wall Street, Bay Street forecasters such as myself, they were actually calling for at least a mild recession this year as far back as last September. It has not happened yet. I would almost liken the economy to that lonely lighthouse in that rather dramatic photo, basically standing tall against all kinds of different things that are coming at it. Um, and I've listed the series of unfortunate events that we've dealt with in recent years, of course, the pandemic back in 2020, inflation, which really got going in 2021. And I think that's an important point that inflation got going in 2021 before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We had a very serious inflation episode before the Ukraine war ever began. And then, of course, last year we had the Ukraine war. We had that dramatic run-up in interest rates, which really was as vigorous as anything we've seen in the last 40 years or so. This year we've had a full-on banking stress in uh, the U.S. regional banks, which spilled over a little bit into Europe as well. And next we're staring down the possibility of a U.S. debt ceiling. I don't want to call it a crisis, but a lot of drama. It's basically a Washington-generated uh, crisis, but it is, you know, it can cause some possible frictions in, uh, in financial markets. The markets are a little bit more positive today on the view that they are going to avoid the worst on that. Uh, but again, I just want to reinforce that that's a self-inflicted problem that, uh, that we're dealing with on that front. But amid all this, as I said, basically the, the economy has managed to grind through this and we have yet to enter that, uh, that so-called downturn that so many of us were calling for as far back as last, uh, last fall. Meanwhile, there has been some relatively good news on the other big economic story in recent years, and that's on the inflation front. You know, last summer, U.S. inflation got above 9%. It got above 8% in Canada. That's as high as we've seen since the early 1980s in both economies. It's come down a lot, um, below 5% in both cases. We got uh, the latest number just yesterday in Canada was a little bit higher than expected. It, I, I, frankly, we weren't that surprised. It was a tenth higher than what we had been calling for, but the markets got all agitated. Now they're talking about the Bank of Canada possibly having to raise interest rates again. We have long said that getting from 8% down to 4% was going to be easy. That was basically, all it took was gasoline prices to stop rising. And in fact, gasoline prices have come down a bit. That alone has almost knocked four percentage points off of uh, headline inflation. But it's getting from the sort of 4% range back to where the central banks are comfortable, closer to 2%, that's going to be more difficult. We're going to need a lot of help on that front. And that's something that we think will take longer. It'll take about a year before we're, we're in more comfortable territory. And there's going to be days like yesterday where we do get some disappointment on inflation because the reality is, is underlying inflation, as my little footnote there says, 
is, has been sticky at around 4%. And something has still got a crack to get inflation down closer to, uh, to 2 which is where the, uh, the central banks will be more comfortable. Now, on the economic outlook, as I said at the outset, uh, the surprise has been how well things have held in. We actually uh, got off to a pretty good start in the, uh, the first quarter of this year. Our official call still is for a mild downturn over the next couple of quarters in both Canada and the U.S. Technically, two quarters of negative GDP, that's often the go-to definition of at least a shallow recession. I hesitate to use the R word because this is a very unique cycle. Um, but we simply do believe that that big run-up in interest rates we've seen in the past year has really only just begun to seriously begin to bite into the consumer and the, and the housing market. And we think ultimately that will uh, undercut growth over the, uh, the next six to nine months. Then we see things stabilizing late this year and somewhat picking up next year. But when you wrap it all up and add it together, we're looking at roughly 1% growth or a little bit better, all told, for this year and next. Just in both Canada and the U.S., by the way. Just to put those numbers into perspective, a so-called normal year for the Canadian U.S. economy would be real growth, this is after inflation, excluding inflation, of about 2% a year. That's a normal year. So we're definitely looking at slower than normal growth this year and next. And this, this is basically manufactured by the central banks. They're, this is exactly what they want. They've raised interest rates to try to cool things down, hopefully without tipping things into an outright recession, but this is exactly what the doctor ordered, is a period of relatively slow growth to help take some of the steam out of, uh, out of, out of inflation. Now, whether we do go into a downturn or not will ultimately come down to the consumer. And to use a very technical word, this economy has been weird in recent years as a result of the pandemic. And the weirdness really starts and ends with the consumer because the consumer has saved a lot of money in, in recent years. I mean, when you think back to 2020, you know, we couldn't go to an Oilers game, we couldn't go, you couldn't go traveling, you couldn't go to a restaurant, and yet our incomes were totally well supported uh, by government policy. So people were banking the money. In the second quarter of 2020, the personal savings rate in Canada hit 30%. We've never seen a savings rate like that. Now it's come down, but people are still saving faster than they used to. Uh, before the pandemic. The, the current personal savings rate is running at about 5 to 6%. Before the pandemic, it was 2%. So people are still saving a, a higher share of their, uh, their income than they were before the, uh, the pandemic, and that's on top of what they built up during the pandemic. Now, there's lots of different measures of these so-called excess savings. There's different ways to come at it. The most generous measure is what I got up there, $350 billion. A more conservative measure is if we just look at our own balance sheets and look at those of the other chartered banks, look at how much is in personal deposits, whether it's term or, or, uh, or short-term deposits, they're about $150 billion higher than we would have expected at this time. And to me, that's the most conservative measure. That's a lot of money. That's about 10% of disposable income. So consumers are well-armed still at this point. On top of that, I still believe there's a lot of pent-up demand. I still think there's a lot of pent-up demand for you know, getting out there to concerts again, to, to, to travel again. There's also pent-up demand for motor vehicles. You know, Anybody who's tried to buy a car or a truck in the last couple of years knows what I'm talking about. The supply has just been not been able to keep up with demand because of the chip shortage. So we're in this really, really weird situation where we could have the economy overall seeing a bit of a contraction over the next year at a time when motor vehicle sales are actually going up. Usually, motor vehicle sales are at the leading edge of any downturn we have. They're usually the first thing to fall because they're interest sensitive, they're discretionary purchase, they're a big ticket purchase, and usually they're the first thing to give way in any kind of an economic downturn. But there's so much pent up demand, we think, for auto or autom automobiles uh, that uh, we think that's going to be actually a source of support for the economy over, over the, uh, the next year. That's one of the reasons why, again, I hesitate to call what we're looking at a recession. And it, you know, I, my, the title of my presentation is not your parents' recession. This is a very unusual cycle, and autos play a bit of a role in that. So that's the good news. We got this excess savings and pent up demand for a lot of uh, goods and services still. The less good news is the right hand chart, and that's household debt never went away during the pandemic. In the early days of the pandemic, people paid off their credit card debt when they couldn't spend on anything else. But then credit card debt came right back up. And then on top of that, we had a full-on housing boom, which led to a big run-up in, in mortgage balances. So now we're in a situation where the typical household has a dollar eighty of debt for every dollar of income. That's about as high as we have ever seen. It's a lot higher than it is in the US, uh, by the way, as well. And 
I, I believe that those people are still vulnerable to the run-up in the interest rates that we've seen in the last year. To a large extent, those, lo, those debtors have been sheltered. You know, maybe they're in a, in a fixed rate mortgage that hasn't come due yet, but it will come due, and they, they will face much higher interest rate payments. Or even if you're in a variable mortgage rate, your bank may have been protecting you up to this point. They may have been shielding you somewhat or in the early stages of that, you know, seeing more of your payments going to interest only rather than, than to principal. In some cases, people have been allowed to, to actually increase the principal on their mortgages. But there too, the piper will be paid. And I think that uh, it's almost like the boa constrictor. It will slowly squeeze down on, uh, on the debtors out there. Now, you may be wondering, well, how can you be talking about excess savings, you know, this massive amount of savings on the one side and record levels of household debt on the other side? How do we square those two circles? Basically, I always like to say it's two different groups of people. But almost all of that household debt is, is held by about 40% of households. And then I think it's a different 40% that's sitting on most of the savings at this point. And then there's another 20% who really don't have much savings or, or debt. So there's two really different experiences out there. There's some households who are doing just fine. In fact, they may have even benefited from the rise in interest rates that we've seen in the past year. And then there's another group that really does, is gonna face the, uh, the squeeze over, over the next year. How this all sorts out is I think ultimately, the consumer will hold up better than you would normally expect, partly because of that buildup of, of savings, the pent up demand, and the final factor is the underlying strength of the job market. I mean, we've seen strong job markets before, but it is hard to describe just how robust this job market is. In recent months, Canada's unemployment rate has been pretty steady at 5%. In the last 50 years, we've had one month, one month in the last 50 years where unemployment has been lower than 5%. It was actually last summer, got down to 4.9. This is an extraordinarily low jobless rate that we've been dealing with. In the US, it's even lower. It's 3.4%. That's as low as any unemployment rate that we have seen since the Korean War. In fact, I would assert that we have got as low, as tight a job market in North America right now as we have seen in peacetime, if you consider this uh, to be peacetime. It's not just a North American story, by the way. If you look at that table on the right-hand side, you can see most major economies are looking at lower unemployment rates now than they had before COVID. And in most cases, those are extraordinarily low unemployment rates, including you can see Japan and Germany is even lower than the US. Alberta's unemployment rate is a little bit above the national average. It's well down uh, from COVID levels, but among the major economies, it is true. Alberta's isn't quite as tight as some of the other provinces, and that's unusual. Historically speaking, Alberta often has the tightest job market in the country. Now it's more like places like Saskatchewan, BC, and, uh, and Quebec have actually got the tightest. But you can see the improvement is coming in Alberta, and we've, we've seen quite, uh, quite a downturn there as well. Now in the year ahead, based on our view on things cooling down, we do see the jobless rate going up a little, but I have to tell you that's almost like a central bank's dream that the unemployment rate only nudges up a little bit. That's almost exactly what they're, they're trying to achieve. Uh, that's pretty close to a soft landing, that very modest increase in, uh, in the jobless rate that we have forecast over the next year. Now, there's a couple demographic factors that I want to talk about. This is much bigger picture stuff, but I think it's important when we're analyzing the economy in this day, day and age. First one is just this coming wave of retirements we have. You know, this is something we've known about for decades. We had, in Canada, we had the biggest baby boom in the world. And it peaked in the late 1950s, 60s. And that chart on the left-hand side just gives you an idea how extreme that baby boom was, both compared to the US and historical precedent. So that's the number of births, not percentages or anything like that. And you can see how those years, back in the late 50s, early 60s, it's the blue bar, really stands out. There's been nothing like that since. Now that mass of people are now in their early 60s. Now I'm not gonna be ageist, but the age 65 still really matters. I'm sure everybody in this room knows somebody who's worked beyond the age 65, but you probably also know somebody who's retired before the age 65. 65 is the number on average. That is the median and average retirement age in Canada, so it matters. And we've got this big, big mass of people, as I said, who are now in their early 60s, who are approaching retirement age in the next couple of years. So the bottom line there is if you think it's hard to find a skilled or experienced worker now, just wait in the next couple of years after this, this uh, wave retires. Now, in response to that, 
and as I said, we've known this has been coming at us like a freight train for, uh, for years. It kind of got forgotten during COVID, by the way, uh, but it sort of reemerged very much so as, as a big issue. Ottawa has, uh, you know, has, has basically opened the doors further uh, to immigration. And I think the single most important economic statistic I have heard uh, for this year was that the Canadian population grew by 1 million people in 2022. We have never had the population grow by a million people in a single year before. Now, there were all kinds of special factors last year. We had a lot of Ukrainian refugees. We had a lot of international students returning. We had a lot of temporary foreign workers. So sure, there were some special factors involved there. But even if you smooth out through the three years of COVID, the average population growth rate in the last three years has been 1.5% a year. That's strong. That's basically, you know, back to where we were just in the days before COVID, which we were pointing out was exceptionally strong. You know, yeah, if, if you go back many, many decades, there have been episodes where Canada's population has grown a little bit faster than that, but that's right up there on a historical perspective. Meanwhile, take a look at the green line on the right-hand chart, what the U.S. is doing. It's going in the opposite direction. They're seeing a slowdown in their population growth to less than half a percent a year. That's actually the slowest population growth we've seen in the U.S. since World War I, over 100 years since we've seen the U.S. population growing that slowly. That's not normal. Usually Canada and the U.S. tend, you know, for many decades, Canada and the U.S. tended to see very similar population growth. And in recent years, we've seen this huge wedge open up. I think it's very important to keep that fact, that wedge, in the back of your mind. Whenever we're comparing and contrasting Canada and the U.S., you know, it matters for things like auto sales, it matters for home sales, it matters for the job numbers, it matters for even things like the number of cell phone contracts and that sort of thing. Obviously, you know, much more potential for our, uh, for our telephone companies, or telecom companies, I, I should say. It's a very important statistic. And one way it's played out, besides the housing market, which I'll get into in a minute, is in the labor market. I do think it's acted as a little bit of a relief valve here in Canada for employers. Yeah, it's been hard to find workers, but not as hard as it's been in the U.S. And as a result of that, we've seen a little bit more modest wage growth here in Canada than in the U.S. You know, think back to that big public sector strike we just had among the federal workers. Um, you know, it, there, of course, there was a lot more than just the wage increase, but they end up getting 3% a year over four years. Fairly generous, but certainly not out of bounds, given what, what inflation is doing, not as a standalone number. And the, the typical Canadian worker seeing wage gains of about 4%, or maybe as, uh, depending on which measure you look at, maybe as high as 5%. In the U.S., it's more like 5 6 or even 7%. So there's a real gap in terms of how fast wages are growing. And we expect that to continue for a while. And that's playing out in the inflation numbers. I mean, consistently through the pandemic, the U.S. has had higher inflation than Canada has. And that's despite the fact that Canadian dollar has tended to weaken in the last uh, year or two, which has added to our to our import costs. You know, when you buy food or gasoline, uh, the Canadian dollar does, does matter there. So even with a relatively weak Canadian dollar, we've had consistently lower inflation in Canada than the U.S. That's not normal. That chart on the left-hand side that looks at a very long uh, picture of Canadian U.S. inflation going all the way back to 1960, you can see that where the U.S. leads on inflation, Canada does tend to fall. There isn't usually a lot of daylight between the two economies. But in recent years, Canada's had pretty consistently lower inflation. We more or less expect that to continue through the most of this year, and then we see it evening out a bit more in 2024. The other point of that, that picture is basically the bar chart on the right. It's to show you that U.S. and Canada are not outliers. We're pretty much middle of the pack globally in terms of inflation. There's other economies that actually have a lot higher inflation than we do. Britain's looking at 10% inflation now. Europe's at 7%. Australia and Mexico are also above us. Japan is lower. Japan is always lower than Canada. In the 30 years before the pandemic, Japan had no inflation for 30 years. So 3% inflation for them is actually on the high side. The one real outlier here is China. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But the end result is basically China's got the wherewithal to actually be able to ease policy to support their economy to cut interest rates while everybody else is having to go the other way at this point because they don't have much inflation. Uh, by the way, the numbers that just came out yesterday showed that Alberta's inflation rate is very close to the national average. Uh, nothing out of the or ordinary going on in this province. It's uh, very much uh, similar to, uh, to the rest of the country. Actually, as recently as a couple months ago, Alberta was, uh, was easily the lowest in the country, but it kind of popped up a little bit uh, just in the latest month and is, is closer to, uh, to the Canada-wide average. Now, I'm often asked, how did we go 
from decades of basically, you know, one and a half to two percent inflation to suddenly eight percent inflation, and now, you know, yes, it's come down, but still relatively high inflation of four percent. And there was no single factor here. There was no one item, no one area that led to the run-up inflation. I, I would say everything that could have gone wrong on the inflation front in 2021 and 22 went wrong. Um, if I had to pick five big themes, very, very briefly, one was energy prices. So they you know, were scraping along the bottom during the pandemic, they came roaring back. That was really what, what lit the match. But energy prices have left the building as an inflation driver. In fact, if you look at this, uh, this, this table, so the left-hand side looks at things have, that have come down in price. These are different, uh, different items in the consumer price basket in Canada. Uh, some services, some goods. Um, it shows you the percent change in the last, uh, last year. Fuel oil and gasoline prices are actually on the left-hand side. They've dropped in price over the past year. So energy has kind of gone away as a, as a big inflation driver. The second item was the reopening. Nobody traveled in 2021. It seemed like everybody traveled in 2022. Well, that pushed up motel rates. It pushed up airfares. Those things are starting to stabilize. Airfares, believe it or not, are actually down in price from, uh, from a year ago. Hotel rates are still up a lot, but they're starting to moderate as, as well. They're not rising as quickly as they had been. I think those areas are going to stabilize a bit. Third story, the one we all heard so much about for a couple years was the supply chain issues. Paul even mentioned it in his intro. I think those things are starting to work themselves out. Effectively, what happened is it seemed like everybody in the world wanted to buy a dishwasher all at once in 2021. And guess what? The supply chain could not handle that. It just got swamped by this wave of demand. Well, that wave of demand is now starting to recede. And a lot of big ticket consumer items, electronics, furniture, appliances, you know, the supply chain is starting to right itself. Autos, it's going to take a little bit longer, but they're getting there. Auto production, in fact, in North America is now pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels. You can see motor vehicles are still on the right-hand side, but that's a smaller increase than what we'd seen earlier. Uh, furniture prices are, have actually barely risen. Um, you know, I don't know if you get all the Leon's ads here or the brick ads, uh, but, you know, you can see they're actually aggressively advertising in, and they actually are cutting prices. Uh, so a lot of the supply chain issues actually have, have worked themselves out. I, that's that's less of an issue. The fourth factor, a very important one, grocery prices. This is not a Canadian story though. As much as we want to blame our grocers, this is going on globally. I said everything that could have gone wrong for inflation went wrong. Everything that could have gone wrong for food prices went wrong. So in the US, they've had a very similar increase in grocery prices to, to what we've had. In Britain, grocery prices are up 17% from a year ago. In Germany, they're up 20% from a year ago. This is a global problem. There are a lot of things. We had a terrible harvest globally in 2021, slightly better last year, but then you know we had the Ukraine war, which drove up fertilizer prices and it drove up a lot of grain prices as well. We've had the avian flu. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg prices, but they've both gone up a lot. Um, basically, you know, as I said, almost everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. Now, that's one I'm still worried about. I do see slower grocery price inflation over the next year, but I don't see them going into reverse. I don't see food prices coming off. I think there's still going to be a bit of oomph in grocery prices for some time yet. The fifth and final story was the housing boom. Now, if you were to go and sell your house tomorrow at a nice profit, that would not show up in the CPI. Existing home prices do not enter directly into the CPI, but a big run-up in home prices will work its way through in a number of different channels, whether it's real estate commissions, which do get included, whether it's new home prices, whether it's rent, and you can see rents are really rising. That's about as rapid an increase as we have seen in many, many decades in Canada. And it's also, of course, pushed the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates, and it shows up in mortgage interest costs, which are now the single biggest driver of inflation at, uh, at, at this point. Now, just for your interest, uh, I've also included some things that have actually come down in price on the left-hand side. Believe it or not, there are some things that have come down. I mentioned gasoline, but uh, child care uh, costs have come off a lot. That's the deal that Ottawa worked out with the, uh, with the provinces. Things like spectator entertainment. I find that one a little bit hard to believe. I don't know about you. You know, if you've been to a, a hockey game or a concert, it's pretty hard to believe that spectator entertainment costs have come down. But I... I'm going to have to trust uh, StatScan on this one. I'm not sure what it says that recreational cannabis prices have come down. But anyways, when you put all those things into the blender, you do indeed end up with an overall inflation rate just a little bit above 4%. Just as a little bit of a sidebar, I would say historically one of the most common questions I get is, do you believe the CPI numbers? Like, is it real? And all I can tell you is there is no other economic variable that StatScan puts more effort into getting right 
than the consumer price basket. That is an average. Every individual has their own consumer price basket, and I swear every one of the 39 million Canadians thinks their own individual inflation is a lot higher than what Stats Canada tells us. Um, but I, I do trust the numbers. I don't think it's deadly accurate. Like, I don't take the right-hand side of the decimal point that seriously, but I would, I do trust the, uh, the number before the decimal point. I do think it is in the range of 4 to 5 percent. I think that's a, a pretty good estimate of inflation. Now, I do want to spend just a minute talking about the, uh, the housing market because this, you know, I said, I said it was one of the factors driving inflation. It's now gone into reverse, of course, over the past year. In fact, I've never seen a housing market go from as hot as it was to as cold as it was within the space of a couple months last year. It was like somebody turned the light switch off for the housing market uh, just a little bit more than a year ago. And the chart on the left shows you the number of homes sold. And you can see, you know, during the pandemic, things stalled out and then they came roaring back. But then they stayed at that incredibly high level for two years. And then, like I said, about a year ago, uh, it was like the light switch got turned off and sales have now dropped to some of the lowest levels that we've seen in, in a decade. In recent months, there are signs that things are starting to stabilize across many major cities. And there's even indications that prices are starting to creep up. But we've had a full-on correction in the housing market. Since they peaked last spring, last March, uh, they dropped by 16% from top to bottom. As I said, they bounced up a little bit in the last couple months uh, nationally. But 16% is a very, very serious correction. However, there is a huge regional aspect to this. Take a look at the bar chart on the right-hand side. Which cities have dropped the most since they peaked a year ago? Ottawa, Toronto, Hamilton, Kitchener-Waterloo, and London. What do those five cities all have in common? Free dessert to anybody who can tell me what those five cities all have in common. No dessert. All in London. Or all in London. All in Ontario. Sort of missed the punchline there. Um, so Ontario, Ontario had the biggest housing party during the pandemic, and now it's having the biggest hangover. Um, meanwhile, at the other end of the spectrum, a lot of cities in the prairies really weren't that frothy during the, the pandemic and are really not suffering major consequences. Now, look at Calgary. Calgary's actually above where they were a year ago. If we come back in a year from now, I wouldn't at all be surprised if Calgary's up even further. I would expect Edmonton prices to be largely flat over the next, uh, next year. So there's a very, very big regional difference. It's pretty much, you can draw a straight line from the cities that had the biggest increase during the pandemic are now seeing the biggest correction. Those that had the smallest increase during the pandemic are also seeing the smallest correction. Basically, we just blew the froth off. I will say that it looks, as I said, it looks nationally like the market has found a floor here um, because the Bank of Canada so clearly signaled that they were moving to pause, that the job market has stayed so healthy uh, it does look like the housing market is starting to stabilize. I'm still skeptical that we're looking at a big bounce back just yet. I think the market is still digesting that rise in interest rates we've seen over the past year. So what of the interest rate outlook? Uh, I mentioned at the outset that we had that uh, mild upside surprise in inflation just the other day. We've had signs that the housing market is starting to stabilize. So there's a lot more talk that the Bank of Canada may have to raise interest rates again. That's not our official view yet. We're still of the view that we've seen the last Bank of Canada hike, which was delivered in, in January. We think the bank will grit their teeth and wait it out. And then we see them beginning to cut interest rates mildly next year when they're more satisfied with the inflation outlook. That's our official view. The risk of that call is that the bank might feel the need to raise rates a little bit further yet. Not by a great deal, but I do see the possibility of another quarter to half a point hike through the, uh, the summer and early fall if inflation doesn't uh, get back on its downward trend in the, in the next couple months or, or so. Uh, it's more or less an, a similar story for the Fed. The U.S. Central Bank, they kept going longer than the Bank of Canada. For, they went further. They, they raised rates by five full percentage points from the low to, uh, to the peak, uh, 75 basis points more than the Bank of Canada did. They have not officially said that they're paused yet. There are still some officials in, in the U.S. who are still talking about the, openly about the possibility of further rate hikes. Our view is that the Fed has probably done just enough and that they'll now wait things out through the rest of this year and then begin trimming interest rates next year. Uh, again, for the Fed, I think the risk of that call is, if we're going to be surprised, is that rates do need to go just a wee bit higher yet. Now, above and beyond just that, you know, you know, whether they have to go another quarter or a half or not, you know, when do they start cutting, I think maybe the more interesting question is, where are interest rates going to ultimately settle out when we get out into, say, 2025 or 2026? So are interest rates eventually going to come all the way back down to the very low levels that we saw before the pandemic? Uh, 
or are they going to settle out more, you know, fairly close to, to current, relatively high levels? And I think that's the more interesting question. Our, our view is that the truth will be somewhere in between, that we're not going to go back down to those lows we saw in the decade before the pandemic. Something really has changed on the inflation front. Before the pandemic, central banks are really having trouble getting inflation up to their 2% target. In the years ahead to come, we think they're going to have a difficult time getting it back down to their 2% target. And that means rates fundamentally are going to have to be higher than they were in the, in the decade before the pandemic. They, we believe they're well above neutral or normal at current levels. Where we think they ultimately settle out is about two percentage points lower than we are today. So if you look at, say, just the Bank of Canada's so-called overnight interest rate, it's now four and a half percent. We see it getting down to about two and a half percent when you get out into the 2025, 26. Again, that's higher than anything we saw in the 10 years before COVID. So it is a different world in, in that decade, but it is uh, substantially below uh, where current rates are as well. And, and, and frankly, the Bank of Canada tends to agree with that view. The, the bank has a very public view on what they view as being normal for interest rates, and their view is for their own interest rate, it's somewhere between 2 to 3%. So they would, you know, if the governor of the Bank of Canada was standing here, that's exactly what he would tell you, is that uh, rates are right now relatively restrictive, and they don't believe they have to always be restrictive, uh, only until inflation gets closer to where they'd like to see it. Last topic I'll touch on just before we open it up for uh, questions is just on the uh, the Canadian dollar itself. Um, you know, I used to always proudly bring this chart out to show how the Canadian dollar was driven by oil prices first and foremost. It was like a dog on a leash. Wherever oil prices go, the Canadian dollar would, uh, would follow. I used to always say that every $10 move in oil prices would move the Canadian dollar three cents in the same direction. It used to work like a charm until it didn't. About five years ago, that relationship started to weaken. In the last few years, it has completely gone astray. There's been almost no relationship between oil prices and the Canadian dollar. Now, it's not that oil does not matter to the Canadian economy. It certainly matters. It still definitely matters to the Alberta and Saskatchewan economies. It's just the conventional view out there, and by the way, that's worthy of a half an hour discussion unto itself as to why this relationship is broken down. Um, but the view out there in the foreign exchange market is the Canadian economy just doesn't have the same torque or get the same torque from higher oil prices that it used to. So in other words, when oil prices used to go up, we used to get a capital spending boom here in Alberta. You'd get a jobs boom. Now, oil companies are a little less, uh, you know, less open about cranking up capital spending. If, if there's an oil price windfall, it'll turn into higher dividend payments. Um, yes, it helps incomes for sure. It helps government revenues, but it doesn't really turn into a big jobs boom or capital spending boom. The other factor at, at play is, look, the Canadian dollar is a relative price between Canada and the US. And what's changed in the last 10 to 15 years? The US itself has become a much more significant oil producer in the last 10 years. So the relative benefit of Canada versus the US from higher oil prices is less obvious than it used to be. You know, it's not necessarily a big negative for the US economy anymore when oil prices rise because they're such a significant oil producer in their, in their own right. I still believe that when push comes to shove, higher oil prices do benefit the Canadian dollar or should benefit the Canadian dollar a little bit. But that's not the way foreign exchange traders are, are seeing it. Um, our underlying view, by the way, is somewhat constructive on oil prices. We might be a bit too optimistic on this front, but we're, um, our economic forecast is based on the assumption of, uh, of WTI uh, trending in the $80 to $85 range over the next 12 to 18 months. Of course, as we speak, it's closer to $72 uh, at, the, at the moment, so that would imply a bit of an upswing from here. In part, that somewhat optimistic view on oil prices is what does somewhat inform our, our Canadian dollar outlook. But more importantly, the single biggest driver of the Canadian dollar is the US dollar itself. So when the US dollar is strong against everybody, we're down here with everybody else. We're weak with the euro, the pound, the yen. And that's essentially what's happened in the last 18 months. The US dollar has been ascendant. We do see that coming to an end in the next uh, little while. It's already uh, off its highs. We see the US dollar losing some altitude in the next 18 months as the end of Fed uh, tightening and, and a reversal of Fed policy begins. And on the flip side of that, we're on the other side of the teeter-totter. We see the Canadian dollar somewhat levitating back towards what I would consider to be 
a range of fair value for the currency. My own view is longer term fair value for the Canadian dollar is somewhere in the 76 to 78 cent range. I, I view that as, as, so we're not far from that, but we're a little bit below what I would consider to be fair value for the, uh, the Canadian dollar. Uh, that's uh, pretty much it for the, uh, the formal part of the presentation. Just to, to wrap it up in a nutshell, you know, as I said, I would agree with the cautious folks in the room. I, I, I still think that the, the, the economy still has to digest that big run up in interest rates and we are going to see it bite down a little bit more heavily on the consumer in, uh, in, the, in the months ahead. But we do not believe that this is, you know, as I, my, the title of my presentation, this is not your parents' recession. Uh, this, this is not a garden variety cycle by any means. There's a number of unique aspects to it, a number of reasons to believe the consumer can be a little bit more resilient and the economy as a whole can be a bit more resilient than it would normally be in the face of such a run up in, uh, in interest rates. And a lot of that just goes back again to that buildup of excess savings, the strong labor market and pent up demand. Uh, with that, I'd uh, be happy to take some questions now. It uh, looks like we have about 20 minutes for, uh, for questions. So if there's anything, I, topics that I didn't touch on, I'm sure there are, you'd like, or if there's something you'd like me to go into more detail, I'd be happy to do that as well. And we have mic, uh, two mic runners, so if you could just wait uh, for the microphone to come to you. We have a gentleman here in the front row in that corner. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Great uh, presentation. Thanks for coming to Edmonton. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the participation rate of labor, <clears throat> specifically in the U.S. Um, you kind of talked about demographics and population growth. Is there anything else to kind of explain um, the really low unemployment in the U.S. and this participation rate that everybody talks about? Yeah, and thanks for that question. And the, and the labor market's been all over the place in, uh, in, in recent years. And by the way, you may have heard the, the phrase the great resignation or, or the big quit. That was really a U.S. phenomenon. That, that did not happen in most other major economies. It did not happen in Canada. Yeah, people left the labor force for a couple months in the early days of the pandemic, but they, they essentially, most people came right back. They stayed engaged. Uh, if you look at the, the participation rate, and, and for those of you who don't follow this stuff every day of your life like I do, uh, the participation rate is basically the share of, the, of a certain segment of the population that has got a job or is looking for a job, so is essentially counted as being in the labor force. Um, if you look at the participation rate for those aged 15 to 64, it's as high as it's ever been in Canada right now. In the U.S., it did fall in the wake of COVID, for, and there's a variety of reasons for that. There's a lot of theories out there why, why that happened, a lot of them perfectly good, but it, they, they've come, it's come back. It's pretty much fully recovered. So the great resignation lasted as long as Tom Brady's first retirement, uh, not, not that long. Um, Americans have essentially come back. It's, um, so that did explain why, partly why the unemployment rate came down very quickly. It doesn't really explain why it's so low now. So um, it's, it's almost fully back to normal. Not, not 100% in the US. People at one point, they were talking about the millions of missing Americans. Most of them are back now. So that, that doesn't really explain why, why the labor or why the unemployment rate is, uh, is so low. A partial explanation is, is similar to Canada. They, they also had a, a mega baby boom, not as big as ours as, as a share of the population. Um, they're, they're seeing quite a retirement wave as well. So that, that's one of the factors holding down the unemployment rate a, a little bit, but that's not artificial. I mean, you know, it's perfectly natural for people to drop out of the labor force once they hit age 65 or, or so. Uh, that's that's just the, uh, the the reality. So, uh, and and by the way, in other economies, the participation rate never really changed that much, and and is is relatively high. So, to answer to answer your question, it's it's really not the explaining factor as to why uh, why the unemployment rate is is so low. Most most of those people are are basically back. It it took a while, uh, but things are mostly back to to normal on on the participation rate front. Thank you. Any other uh, questions at this point? Got a, got a couple there. Thank you, Doug. Um, quick question about if you could walk us through the delicate balancing act of increasing interest rates at the Bank of Canada level uh, to slow things down and to slow down maybe the housing market and things like that while simultaneously being the single biggest driver of inflation. Um, how, how do they balance that and what, what does that math look like from your perspective? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the Bank of Canada is getting some grief. Um, you know, it doesn't help that folks like me pull out that table and show that, you know, the single biggest item is, is mortgage interest costs. I don't want to make too big a deal of that because the weight in the basket, the way they calculate it of mortgage interest costs is actually relatively small. 
So if we were to ask the question, well, what would inflation be if we took that component out? It would be 3.7%. So it's still, it's still too high. And I think the counter argument, if Mr. Macklem was here, is that, well, there are some other things that have happened as a result of the fact that we've raised interest rates. Well, you know, home prices went from rising at about 20% a year to actually falling. Um, and that, and you know, things like new home prices have actually come off. You know, where, where would we be if we had not raised interest rates? Well, those new home prices might still be, you know, run, running to the moon at, at, at this point. And so that's probably acted as almost an equal and offsetting counterpart uh, to, to that rise in mortgage rates. If we just, so if we add all the components together of shelter, all the things that go into housing, it's not really much of an outlier one way or t'other when we look at the overall inflation basket. It's, it's risen at roughly the same pace as, as other components of, of the consumer price basket. So I don't think it's, it's as dominant an issue as, the, as that, as that uh, table would, uh, would, would suggest. I actually thought you were going to ask me uh, uh, the delicate balance between raising interest rates to cool things off without tipping the economy in an outright recession. And that is, that is the other you know, major tightrope they're, they're trying to walk. Um, any central banker would tell you, they, they do not want to push the economy into a, into a recession. Uh, that, that, you know, they're not evil, they're not, they don't want to see people suffer. In an ideal world, you know, what would happen is they'd raise interest rates just enough to take enough steam out of the economy that things would cool without, you know, it would slow down but would not actually go into reverse. The unemployment rate would not rise and inflation would just fall back to their target. But the reality is inflation got so high during this episode that almost something had to break uh, to get inflation back down. And, you know, I, I said in my opening comments that that was the easy part, getting inflation from 8% down to 4.4%. It's going to be a lot tougher to take that next step down. And, and we, we do think the economy probably will have to go at least a little bit in reverse for, for a spell here, um, which does mean the unemployment rate probably has to back up to, uh, to really take the steam out of the economy and get inflation down. Uh, that much further. I'd love to be wrong on that front. I'd like to see inflation come off. But what, what we've seen is even, uh, and it's not just mortgage interest costs, what we've seen is services prices are really now the big driver of inflation. It's, you know, in the early stages of the pandemic when inflation really took off, it was all a good story. It was, you know, things like energy prices, like uh, furniture and appliances and cars. Well, it's services now. And what drives services inflation? It's wages. What drives wages? It's a tight job market. So ultimately, what, you know, the Bank of Canada would never say it, but basically they'd like to see the unemployment rate nudge up just a little bit to take, take a bit of steam out, out, out of the market. Uh, I think we had another question here, this gentleman. Oh, and there's a young lady back there as well. Well, the big uh, way to combat inflation is to get supply up. Yeah. I'm talking about all commodities, Absolutely. energy, the commodities, whatever. And I don't see the wisdom of central banks continually using one narrow little thing called interest. You know, line of credit, for example, in my case, is uh, the 230% increase in one year. That's inflationary. Desperately inflationary. Killer. And it's going to catch up in the mortgage market and everything else. So how do we, the real cause then is, is uh, our investment. And we're going to have lots of underinvestment if we keep interest rates high and keep higher. When are the central banks going to figure that out? And when are the governments going to figure it out to harmonize with that? I'm, I'm not going to defend the government, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what I will say is, you know, of course, we had years of extraordinary low interest rates. You know, if, there were, if, you know, if it was just interest rates that drove business investment, we should have had a boom, you know, because we had, uh, we had 10 years of, of interest rates below... Uh, uh, below inflation, you know, we basically had zero interest rates for uh, for quite a spell of, of time as well. So I think it's it's more than just interest rates that determine investment. Uh, I take your point. You know, absolutely, uh, the central banks raising interest rates is going to do nothing on the on the supply side. Um, all I will say is that you know the, the central banks don't pretend to be able to be able to do anything on 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 uh, on, on the supply side. Um, I'll give a couple reasons why the central banks would choose to do what they would do. First of all, when you have a, all you have is a hammer, every, every problem looks like a nail. Um, I mean, it's really the only tool they have to, uh, to fight inflation, basically, is, is their interest rate uh, policy. But I, 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 a bit more seriously, what, what I would say is they realize, look, they, a central bank can't do anything about a supply chain. They can't do anything about, in, uh, about energy costs. They can't do anything about, uh, about food prices directly. 
But what they're concerned about is if you get a broad-based run-up in things like oil prices, food prices, you get a supply chain issue, there's a fundamental mismatch between demand and supply. What can they control? They can control demand. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring it in a better line with supply. And that's, that's the whole point of raising interest rates is to cool spending to bring demand closer in, in line with the, uh, with the existing supply. The other thing they're trying to avoid is after you get a big rise in inflation like we've had, they don't want it setting into people's mindset that, hey, this is normal, this is the new reality. You know, we're always gonna have 8% inflation and, and you know, unions start to bargain for 8% wage increases and you know, firms just assume that they can pass on 8%. Uh, they, they don't want that second round of inflation to really build on itself. So they're trying to stop that from taking place like a almost, I hate to use this phrase, but a wage price spiral uh, developing uh, as a result of a shock in, say, energy and food prices. That's what they're trying uh, to guard against. They know full well there's nothing they can do about energy prices. There's nothing they can get to, you know, the dock workers working harder in Los Angeles, you know, to load things faster, to, you know, to improve the supply chain. They, they know they can't do anything about that, but they can guard against second round uh, effects. Um, I, you know, I take your point on, uh, on investment policy, but, you know, all, all I can say is, whether it was government policy, you know, some capital uh, uh, ca uh, capital spending uh, incentives that uh, that Ottawa put in place a number of years ago, or exceptionally low interest rates, you know, I, I would say policy was actually relatively supportive of business investment, and just it really didn't it didn't happen. And and you know, of course, a lot of a lot of the commodity cost increases we face are global in nature, and there's there's nothing that Canadian policy can really do. You know, we're not, we're not going to be able to bring down global oil prices on our own or bring down wheat prices on, on our own here in Canada, whatever, whatever is done in Ottawa. Uh, and, and really, that, that was one of the big sparks of inflation was, you know, was, was a, a commodity price rebound that, uh, that really we had no say in. And we had no say in, uh, in, in global supply chains either. There, they, they really was beyond the control of, uh, of government policymakers here in Canada. And by the way, I don't mean to be an apologist for, uh, for the Bank of Canada. That's, that's actually a very common, um, I wouldn't say complaint, but a very common statement that I, that, that I hear. I hear economists making that same, same statement here in Canada that, you know, why, why is the central bank raising interest rates? It makes no sense. They, you know, they can't do anything about global oil prices. But it's, if, if I were to defend the Bank of Canada, that's, that's what I would say, is they know that. They're, they're just trying to uh, make sure we don't get that second round echo effect of, of inflation really sticking and lasting above and, and beyond that. Thank you for that question. And I do believe there's one right back there. Thank you, Doug. This has been really informative. My name is Sally Monroe, and I've spent 43 years in real estate right here in Edmonton. So it really is a very delicate balance managing interest rates. It's always about the cost of money. And there's no question that 2% rates <laughs> a couple of years ago was just an anomaly. I don't see interest rates being able to sustain at 4.5%, 5% for mortgage rates. Every time the rate goes up, it has a direct correlation with the value of people's homes. And, uh, but I, I'm hoping that the rates will maybe settle out at 3.5%, but... My question, the future, the next generation, do you see them as committed to home ownership as the rest of us have been? Let's, let's do a poll of people under the age 40 in this room. Are you still as committed to home ownership? I, I mean, I, I don't think the desire has gone away. Um, you know, of course, it, it, uh, home affordability, of course, is, uh, is, is incredibly difficult at, uh, at, at this point. Um, it's interesting that when you look at the share of home ownership in Canada, it uh, now stands at about, I believe, 65 or 66 percent, which historically is, is relatively high. It's, it, it hasn't changed that much over the years, but that, that is on, on the high side. And internationally, it's, it's certainly not the highest, but it, it is a bit higher than, than normal when, when we look around other you know, Western or major, uh, major economies. It's a little bit higher than, uh, than others. Um, but I, th I think the, the main point there is it's, um, you know, the current home ownership rate in Canada is not particularly high or low uh, by historic standards, as, a, as I said, a little bit on the high side, and internationally it's a little bit on the high side. Um, I, I'm guessing that, you know, given the, the, the state of home affordability that we're looking at right now in the country, that that number's probably gonna come down a bit. 
in, in the years ahead. Um, I, look, I, I don't like this trend, but I think it's developing. We're, we're definitely seeing the investor class move into the, the residential sector, you know, whether it's mom, mom and pop uh, investor or it's a big institutional investor, they, they're buying up a lot more of the housing stock. And, you know, they're, they're basically becoming the landlords. And so I do think that uh, individual homeownership is, is probably in, in that world that is likely to, uh, to go south uh, from, uh, from current levels. I, you know, I, I have no indication, and look, I got a lot of nieces and nephews too, who are in that uh, sort of, in that prime age, where they're uh, looking, looking to get a, get a home. As, you know, as far as I can tell, they're as committed as, as we were uh, back, uh, back in the day. It's just whether they're gonna be able to is, uh, is, is a bigger question, I have my doubts. Actually, I actually do think the home ownership rate is, is, is gonna drift down, as I said. It does depend on the city too. Um, some cities have gotten a little bit more crazy than others. Uh, unfortunately, what I call the Toronto disease uh, does seem to be spreading uh, to other areas of, of the country. We've seen it sweep uh, southwestern Ontario. We've seen it sweep in even into Atlantic Canada where you know, get these ridiculous bidding wars on, on anything that, uh, that comes up. Um, it's, it's not like that in, in every city. Some cities are certainly more affordable than others. I would categorize Edmonton as actually being relatively affordable, uh, believe it or not, when, uh, when we look at other, other cities. So there's still hope here, I think. Um, but Toronto or Vancouver, hmm, it's, it, it is tough. It is really tough. Um, and, and frankly, I don't, I, don't, I don't see it necessarily getting better in, anytime soon. I'm, I'm actually on a housing affordability panel and I'm sure I'm gonna really uplift people's spirits with that, that kind of talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, I don't think there's a magic answer here. I mean, every, everybody always talks about supply, but you know, frankly, the, the kind of ho numbers of homes that we're building, we're building about you know, a quarter of a million a year. That's nice. But that, that really is, is only keeping up with the population growth if you, know, if you think the average home size is somewhere between two to three. You know, and as, as I said, the population is growing about, uh, on average about 600,000 a year uh, these, these days. So we need every one of those houses, if not more, that's, uh, that's being built. And, and a lot of what's being built, frankly, are condominiums uh, now, which can usually house, uh, house fewer than, than that on average. Thank you for that question. Any, uh, any others? Looks like we've got time for one or two more. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, how do you see the future of Alberta in the medium and long term, considering that the oil and gas companies are not investing back and there's lots of ESG pressure on them? Excellent question. So, Actually, in the short to medium term, we are relatively optimistic on, on the province. Um, we, we actually have Alberta closer to the higher end of the spectrum in terms of the growth. Oh, look, some of that is just driven by demographics. Some of it is driven by the fact that uh, Alberta is in relatively solid fiscal sh situation compared to most, uh, most other provinces, uh, which means it doesn't have to cut back when, uh, when others might. Um, some of it is just driven by the fact that, you know, the underlying uh, resource prices here are, are at relatively healthy levels, even with the pullback that we've seen in, in the past year. Some is the fact that, uh, you know, you're not running into the same labor constraints that we're seeing in a lot of the other big provinces at this point. So we're, we're relatively optimistic on the, uh, the short to medium term outlook for Alberta. Longer term, I take your point completely. Um, I, I, well, while we don't necessarily see oil production, gas production going south anytime soon, it's pretty tough to see it rising much in the, in the years ahead. Um, I see, sure, it might go up a little bit, but I, th I think you know th this is probably about it in terms of the, the level of, uh, of energy production. Um, we'll see how the decades ahead play out, um, but there's, there's no doubt that uh, you know, going to even net zero, let alone absolute zero, is, is going to be a challenge for, for this province. Uh, I am encouraged by some of the um, diversification that we're seeing in, this, uh, in, in the province. I, uh, just a little anecdote, I, I spoke at a, at a tech conference in, uh, in Calgary, an Alberta tech conference uh, just, just before COVID, and I thought I'd be talking to an audience of 50 to 100 people. It was like 750 people, and I think it was just sort of uh, indicative of, of you know, the, the thriving tech sector that, uh, that we, we, we see here. Um, but we're, we're going to need more of, of, of that. Um, you know, as, as I said, we'll see how things play out in the, in the decades ahead. Uh, our, our own uh, equity analysts always like to point out that uh, the oil sands are going to be one of the last things standing uh, 
in terms of oil production because the investment's been made. You know, it's more like a manufacturing. Um, you know, it's, it's as competitive as, as anything except maybe Saudi oil in the years ahead, and it's going to be one of the last uh, sources of oil production that we're, we're going to see globally. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that we're necessarily going to see a big reversal in the, in the years ahead, but uh, it, it, it is definitely a challenge for the Alberta economy over, over the long term. There's no, there's no sugarcoating it. There's, there's, there's no two ways about it. I, I personally would be relatively, relatively optimistic, though, um, that, you know, there are on, on the diversification front and just, just the fact that, uh, you know, have a very well-educated, very well-trained population. And, and as I said, the fiscal situation is, uh, is, is healthy here as well, uh, which, which would help uh, as, as the, uh, the economy transitions in the decades ahead. Hopefully that answers. Oh, we've got a couple right here. So, uh, in case in the future, if the nuclear power, that technology becomes more advanced and more controllable, so would the Edmonton be look at uh, like some more diversified economy development. So coming from Ontario, where nuclear power accounts for over half of our uh, uh, electricity, I can tell you it's not a panacea. It's, it's very expensive to, to build a nuclear plant. I know people talk about uh, you know, the, small, uh, the small plants, but uh, you need a lot of small plants, and they, they can be expensive as, as well. And, and there is the issue of the fuel, uh, the spent fuel, which is not an easy issue to, uh, to grapple with. Uh, nuclear has its own pluses and minuses as well. And really, to me, that's, you know, keep, keep in mind, when, when you're talking about building nuclear, like, that's, that's just basically for domestic, for a home use of electricity. Um, that's, that's not going to replace the oil and gas sector, which is, you know, mo most of where the wealth is there is exporting beyond, uh, beyond the province. Um, so, I, you know, th that's not to discourage uh, certainly looking at nuclear as, as an option, um, as an alternative. Uh, to you know, to burning fossil fuels for uh, to create electricity, I, I think it's probably uh, wise wise to do that. At least uh, consider the options. But I'll tell you, it's not it's it's not a panacea. It's um, it's uh, it's and nuclear's got its pluses and minuses as well. It's very capital intensive. It's very expensive uh, to build out the uh, and, and then the maintenance of a nuclear plant too is very expensive as as well. But thank you for that question. I think we had one more at that table actually. Or we had a gentleman up here as well. I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm seeing next question is the last question, but we'll do two more because that gentleman's question. Uh, hand was up. Hi, my name is Nadine. I just want to ask about rates. We know that the, and, and the interest rate might go up. Most of my clients, when they look for borrowing, they always ask me to look at the crystal ball. Should we go variable? Should we go fixed? Previously, when the rates were lower, variable rates were good, and I always advise them, if you were to go variable, inflate your payment so you can take the maximum advantage. Um, so when rates go up, you can always fix and keep the same payment. But in today's crazy rates, what would you suggest? Uh, yes, the perennial variable versus fixed. Oh, look at that, we're out of time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have to know more about the customer because really it does come down to your own situation. You know, can you sleep at night? with a variable rate. Historically, of course, you know, seven times out of nine, variable rates are the way to go. Um, it doesn't always work that way. I personally would go variable, but that's my own situation, knowing myself, my, my own risk tolerance. Um, all I will tell you is the market is ruthlessly efficient, ruthlessly efficient. It is, has got all the information built into it, and it is very hard to outguess the, the market on a, on a consistent basis. But, uh, you know, a fixed rate, it gives you the assurity, the peace of mind, but you do pay a little bit of that on average over, over time. Clearly, there, are, there have been episodes where, it, you know, it actually has paid to go fixed, but historically, most of the time, it actually does make sense to go variable because you're taking on a bit, of, a bit, a bit more risk. Um, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to tolerate that risk personally, and even if rates go up a little bit, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to be coming down by, by next year and in, in, in 2025 as, as well. But I, I'd, I'd seriously have to know more about the uh, the, the client. I, I will tell you historically, it, it does it, it does tend to favor uh, people going variable uh, most of the the time, and I think this is probably one of those most of the times. But the advantage, the relative advantage, is not going to be that big because, as I said, the market is really efficient at figuring out what what rates are going to do. And last question goes to you, sir. So 
Uh, hello, my name is Arsh. So looking at the Calgary uh, house prices, of course, uh, that's the only city in, in Canada that's increasing by 2%. The reason is because people are moving from Toronto and Vancouver, and the Calgary is the first preferences they have. Would that increase in, of course, an increase in the population? Is it increasing? It's going to be increased in unemployment rate in Calgary? Um, so the question is, would, you know, would the increase in population push up the unemployment rate? Presumably, uh, it, it's, it, it might put a little bit of pressure on, on the labor force, a little bit of upper pressure, but I, you know, there's a lot of vacant jobs in, in Calgary. I, and, of course, when a person moves to, to a city, they, they create a lot of spending on their own, a lot of demand on their own that, you know, it doesn't necessarily push up the unemployment rate. I would, uh, I, I, I would view, you know, a net influx of people to a city from another city as being a net positive for, uh, for home prices at least. By the way, there's a very long-standing relationship. It's almost you can draw a direct line from countries and cities that grow faster, tend to see higher, I'm sorry, see their populations grow faster, tend to see rises in real home prices. And, you know, countries that tend to see shrinking population or stable populations, places like Italy, Spain, Japan, tend to see very weak uh, home prices. So that's, that's part of the reason. I think fundamentally, if I went back to some of my earlier comments, why Calgary has is, is held up well is because they just didn't have the boom that, uh, that other cities did. Uh, they were actually relatively well behaved during, uh, during the pandemic. And we did not see, uh, you know, we, we actually had this measure of how far away cities were from their long run trend, you know, how overvalued they were. We, we were looking at this a year ago. Calgary wasn't particularly overvalued at all. Whereas we had lots of cities in Ontario that we thought were 20, 30, 40% above, uh, you know, were above their long run average and were really ripe for correction, sure enough interest rates go up and you know place like london ontario is down 25 percent almost overnight we, di we didn't think calgary was uh, was really out of bounds I, by the way we we thought the same for edmonton as uh, as as well um not not quite as extreme as calgary but uh, but pretty close i i do see i'm in the red now so i would like to thank you all for uh, for coming out thanks for all the questions uh, those were great and i'd be happy i'm sticking around for a while if uh, you weren't able to ask your question by all means but uh, i'd like to thank you very much and i'll now invite ryan up here thank you Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, a huge thank you to everybody here today uh, for coming and joining this conversation. Uh, having dialogue like this is really important as we sort of navigate these extraordinary, or as Doug put it, weird times. Um, and you know, at BMO, we're always looking to find ways to bring value to our clients, and this was just one way that we thought um, you could uh, take a little value away from, from having Doug out here. Um, but we're always looking to hear about uh, what else you'd like to, to know more about. And so please, reach out to your relationship manager, reach out to your personal banker, reach out to your investment advisor, let them know what you'd like to hear more of, and uh, we'll do what we can to bring that out to you. Um, for all the business owners in the room, uh, I do want to just uh, acknowledge and, and thank you uh, for, um, you know, your resiliency. And, and here at BMO, we believe that uh, owning a business is an act of courage. And uh, we're here uh, for your partnership, and uh, we want to continue to be your partner. So thank you again for, uh, for choosing BMO. Uh, last thing, once again, uh, just thank you to Doug for the insight. Um, thank you for the great questions that drove uh, a phenomenal Q&A. And um, at the end of uh, today or maybe tomorrow, you'll get a, an email that will include sort of the presentation that you would have seen today, so you can have that with you as well. Uh, thank you, everybody. As Doug said, there's going to be a little bit of networking that happens afterwards, so please stick around. Uh, thanks again for coming. Take care.